Good morning. Some four and a half years ago, the U.S.-led coalition began military operations in Afghanistan with two missions. First, to defeat al-Qaeda and their Taliban allies, and second, together with the Afghan people and the international community, to help create the conditions where international terrorism could never again find witting support and sanctuary. Viewed from the baseline of October 2001, the start of Operation Enduring Freedom, the progress made to date in Afghanistan is significant, but challenges do remain. We are winning, but the war is not yet won. The coalition continues to attack, disrupt, and maintain pressure on al-Qaeda and its associated terrorist movements. The Afghan National Security Forces, both the Army and the police, steadily grow in strength and in capability and ongoing reconstruction projects across the country are improving the lives of the Afghan people. Still, there is much work ahead, and the international community must remain patient and maintain uncompromising commitment to Afghanistan's success if we are to prevail. Today, that commitment is demonstrated by the growing role of NATO and its 26 member nations in Afghanistan. This summer, NATO's command in Afghanistan, known as the NATO International Security Assistance Force, or NATO ISAF, will expand its areas of operation from northern and western Afghanistan to southern Afghanistan. It is anticipated thereafter NATO will assume responsibility for all of Afghanistan. But it is important to remember that the United States, as a NATO member, will remain the single largest contributor of troops and capability as the NATO ISAF mission expands. The United States military will maintain its counterterrorism forces to strike al-Qaeda and its associated movements whenever and wherever they are found. Moreover, our military will continue to play a central role in the training and the equipping of the Na Afghan National Security Forces, and we will maintain our important contribution to Afghanistan's reconstruction. In addition to the transition from U.S.-led coalition to NATO ISAF international military leads, Afghanistan's continued development will be marked by three other transitions. The second transition underway is the increasing emphasis by the government of Afghanistan and by the international community on the non-military aspects of our collective efforts. In essence, these efforts aim to rebuild Afghanistan's middle ground, that is, the civil society of Afghanistan ravaged by three decades of warfare and terrorism. Throughout Afghanistan's 34 provinces, rebuilding the middle ground remains the primary concern of the Afghan people. A recent poll of Afghans showed that 80 percent see economic reconstruction, not security, as their number one need. To further enhance security and stability, the government of Afghanistan and the international community must work together to improve governance, the rule of law, economic infrastructure, and social services. The third transition is from international to Afghan lead in all aspects of the Afghan state. The growth in size and capability of the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police is one of the most visible and important aspects of this transition. The Afghan National Security Forces, partnered with coalition and NATO units, are expanding their reach and presence more widely within the country. Over time, they will increasingly play the major role in ensuring the stability of their nation. The fourth and final transition relates to the need to find cooperative approaches to fight against international terrorism. Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the international community are threatened by a common enemy. We have endeavored to adopt a coordinated military approach to address this threat, working to improve our combined operational effectiveness and build mutual confidence. For example, on April the 19th, I represented the United States at the 16th session of the Afghan-Pakistan-U.S. Tripartite Commission at Rawalpindi, Pakistan. This session, like those before it, served to further cooperation between the coalition, NATO-ISAF, 
Afghanistan, and Pakistan military forces. We aim to expand information sharing, communications, and personal interactions at all levels of command. Of note, tomorrow, May the 11th, will mark the final day of Exercise Inspired Gambit, a military training exercise that for the first time ever involves the combined elements of the U.S., Pakistan, and Afghanistan Armed Forces. In my discussion of the progress in Afghanistan, I do not want to discount the enormous obstacles that remain. Most pressing, narco-trafficking and related government corruption could threaten the long-term viability of the Afghan state. However, we should not be daunted by these challenges. Instead, we should take stock of the tremendous progress that Afghanistan and the international community have made to date and apply that same commitment to the difficulties that lie ahead. Thank you, and uh, I'd like to take your questions now. And uh, Lolita. Uh, General, considering that there seems to have been some spikes in violence lately, are you seeing increased um, collaboration between Al Qaeda and the Taliban? And do you think this is going to have an impact on how quickly you can turn over some sections of the country to the NATO forces? It, all, it appears as though there also is a very slight increase in the number of U.S. troops that are there, 20 to 23-ish thousand. So is this a trend we're going to see? Well, Lita, the first of all, with regard to the security in Afghanistan, it um, uh, uneven across uh, different places of Afghanistan, for instance, in eastern Afghanistan right now, in Nuristan uh, and in uh, Konar, in the eastern sectors, uh, where we in the Afghan National Army are conducting offensive operations and have economic reconstruction projects moving forward, the security there is much better than it was a year ago. In the southeast of Afghanistan as well, uh, in the main, as the government of Afghanistan continues to expand and strengthen good progress there. In southern Afghanistan, there has been increases in incidents of violence that have occurred over the spring uh, compared to last year's baseline. Several points there I'd make that are important to understand. And, and when we talk about uh, security in Afghanistan more broadly, first of all, uh, important that violence in Afghanistan is not all attributable to Taliban, not all attributable to international terrorism. Indeed, in the South, if that's the area that we'd want to focus on right now, you have challenges of criminality, you have challenges of tribal fighting, you have narco-trafficking, and indeed you do have a Taliban influence there. What I would say is that in southern Afghanistan, there's uh, several districts uh, that are located in northern Kandahar province. Uh, and Tom, maybe you want to point to those in uh, northern uh, Kandahar, northern Helmand, and Orizgan, where it's fair to say the Taliban influence in certain areas is stronger than it was last year. Important, as we talk then about how we'll proceed ourselves and how NATO ISAF will proceed over the summer and through the fall. Back to his different sources of violence, I would tell you, and as I said in my opening remarks, that the solutions to these challenges are not necessarily in the main in the military domain. What will happen over the spring and the summer and the fall as NATO continues to expand its presence and then takes over the mission in the South? Well, several things. First of all, President Karzai has had great success over the past year of continuing to improve the quality of the governors throughout Afghanistan, but especially in southern Afghanistan. There's been improvements that are being made now with the Afghan National Army. As they gain more strength, there will be more presence of the Afghan National Army in the south and spreading out to more bases, partnered with our forces, partnered with NATO forces. Importantly, the police reform continues to move forward. So more police being stationed in the south, but as well, police reform, as it starts to take hold, there will be improvements in the quality of the police. And then I would also say there will be more reconstruction efforts that are taking place. And very importantly, as we talk about NATO ISAF transition, as we proceed through the summer, NATO, at the end of transition, which could occur, the expansion which should occur perhaps by the end of July, at that point in time, NATO collectively will have a much larger presence on the ground in southern Afghanistan than we do to date. So uh, increase of violence in the uh, south, the, the enemy's changed tactics. Uh, I am confident over the course of the spring and the summer and the fall with these transitions that are underway, of which NATO ISAF will play a very important part of those transitions, that the situation will improve by the end of this year.
Uh, could you please forecast uh, U.S. force levels in Afghanistan over the rest of this year? And then could you also say how long do you anticipate U.S. forces would need to remain in the country in significant numbers? The, uh, I wouldn't want to uh, – I would not want to uh, speculate on numbers. The first uh, immediate uh, piece that we're looking at is the transition here to uh, stage three and the NATO ISAF assumption of command in the south. And then after we get that piece set, uh, there'll be adjustments that take place as NATO then starts to look hard at the uh, final stage for transition. Uh, as I said in the opening remarks, the United States will be the largest contributing troop country to that entire force. We will be the largest provider of critical capabilities, such as helicopters, close air support, intelligence capabilities. But I would not want to speculate on numbers at this time. Uh, at some point here, as we look at each one of these transitions, I'll be making specific recommendations to General Abizade, who in turn, of course, will be going to the Secretary of Defense with those recommendations. For a second, because uh, the 23,000, I think a lot of people thought you were going to be uh, uh, lower than that um, uh, right now. I mean, do you think it's possible that you remain at around the current level for the for the remainder of the year? I wouldn't want to uh, speculate uh, on that, and uh, there'll be force adjustments that are made. Uh, it, we'll also remember beyond our beyond the uh, mission of the support for uh, NATO ISAF, a member of NATO ISAF, we'll have the counterterrorist mission. We also have the mission of the uh, training of the Afghan National Security Forces, with NATO probably playing an increasing role there. But there's a set of variables that still remain before I could go back with a very specific recommendation on force levels. General, can, can you bring us up to date on the hunt for high-value targets like uh, bin Laden, Mullah Omar, other remnants of the uh, Taliban regime? The um, I tell you that the uh, that the campaign against uh, al-Qaeda al goes on uh, in an unrelenting way, in a very uh, focused way, by our forces uh, in Afghanistan and by uh, the other elements of the United States government that are partnered in that endeavor. Uh, we've made uh, very good progress, I think, over the course of the past year in continuing to strike the network of al-Qaeda wherever we find it. There has been disruption that has occurred within their middle leadership and some of their higher leadership, but the fight goes on. General, um, you, you've known, undoubtedly addressed this before, but I'm still trying to understand the sort of dividing line between the NATO force and and your forces, the, the counterterrorism mission versus the mission that they're undertaking. Will they be doing offensive operations, NATO that is, in in the south, and will they be going after, for example, Taliban? elements that might still be there? The, uh, the NATO mission is to uh, further uh, stability in Afghanistan and uh, uh, an array of missions that go with that, uh, missions that we uh, within the coalition are conducting every day. Part of those missions in terms of stability operations does have to do with fighting the enemies of the state of Afghanistan, of which Taliban is included, of course, in that uh, group. For the United States, we will maintain, even as the NATO ISAF mission proceeds, though, this uh, capability to strike against the, uh, as we say, the uh, high-value targets or the al-Qaeda structure. We will maintain that capability ourselves with, within Afghanistan. Does that mean that, I mean, I know this is sort of somewhat of a fungible definition, but that you wouldn't go after Taliban concentrations of people? I mean, is that what you're saying, that you would focus? primarily on al-Qaeda and not, and not worry as, as, or leave to NATO the, the job of containing, you know, Taliban? No, let, let me emphasize again that the United States, there is no distinction between the United States and NATO. Uh, our forces, when the NATO ISAF transition, uh, as it continues, we will have combat forces in southern Afghanistan under NATO. We will have the large part of the combat forces in eastern Afghanistan under NATO. And like NATO, all of those forces are committed to the fight against the enemies of Afghanistan. Please. Sir, you said um, that the enemy has changed tactics. Would you elaborate on that? And could you also discuss, um, I think 2005 had a dramatic increase in U.S. casualties in, in Afghanistan over the previous years, what the reasons were for that and um, if you, how you're addressing it? The enemy uh, has changed its tactics over the past year. Uh, we've seen that the enemy has shifted to increasing use of uh, improvised explosive devices. Uh, 
there's been an increase in uh, suicide bombings, albeit in Afghanistan, that the baseline that you begin with for suicide bombings is quite low. So total numbers, uh, not, uh, total numbers have increased, but relative to a low baseline there. So uh, the enemy has changed uh, tactics. Why has the enemy changed its tactics? Well, first of all, going back to last spring and summer, when Taliban massed its forces, especially in the southeast and the south, and they were discovered by coalition forces and the Afghan National Army using our capabilities, we were able to deliver in several instances over the course of the spring and the summer some very decisive defeats to those Taliban forces that had massed. I think that the enemy has adapted to that now and is much more cautious about trying to mass forces. So a preferred tactic then is improvised explosive devices and suicide bombers. We concentrate when we talk about uh, incidents that are occurring out there, we talk about those, but look at the other aspects of what the enemy's doing right now. The enemy uh, intimidation campaign against moderate religious leaders, intimidation campaign against moderate tribal leaders who support the state of Afghanistan. We find the Taliban burning down schools and coercing, in certain instances and in districts, the closure of schools. What does that tell you about the enemy? What it tells you about the enemy when you look at those tactics is what the enemy fears is a continuing strengthening of the state of Afghanistan. The Afghan people in 2004 and 2005, they voted in overwhelming numbers for a new state of Afghanistan. And what the enemy is clear from the use of those tactics, that's what they fear, that building of the middle ground of Afghan society. We were briefed on Afghanistan last month. Uh, we were told of Afghan efforts to uh, conduct counter narcotic operations in Helmand province. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what the update is on, on those operations and, and if U.S. troops are uh, reluctant or unable for whatever reason to, to do their counter narcotics operations themselves, why, why is that? If that's true, why is that? Well, first of all, with the, with the U.S. Uh, military, the, uh, we are not the lead for what is a law enforcement operation, and counter-narcotics is a law enforcement operation. Having said that, that uh, we do provide a great deal of support for those operations. In what domains? First of all, we provide intelligence support for those operations. We provide, when those operations are conducted, if there's uh, a requirement for medical evacuation or in extremis, if uh, close air support would be needed. We provide that. We provide helicopter support uh, that can be used to deliver counter-narcotics forces to the general area of where they might have to conduct operations. So, indeed, we do provide a very important support role for counter-narcotics operations. Now, as to the government of Afghanistan and the operation in uh, Helmand province, uh, Helmand has traditionally been a province uh, over the last decade where there's been a huge production of uh, poppy. This year was the uh, most sophisticated effort and the largest scale effort by the government of Afghanistan, very much with us providing planning support and advice for the government of Afghanistan to take on the challenges of eradication on a quite large scale. So there was a very good effort between a very brave governor in uh, Helmand province, Governor Daoud, cooperating and partnered with the Ministry of Police of Afghanistan and eradication forces, and then backed up by the Afghan National Army to move into Helmand province and conduct eradication on a much larger scale than has ever been attempted. Having said that, this problem of narco trafficking in Afghanistan, you know, the estimates of the uh, scope of the problem right now, um, one forecast uh, or one, uh, one estimate is that half the size of the illicit economy of Afghanistan may be, a may be equaled by narco-trafficking. So whether that's exactly correct or not, it's a problem of enormous dimensions. And this problem, in order to solve it, requires a very sophisticated, comprehensive approach. There's law enforcement. There's a need to provide alternative livelihoods to the farmers of Afghanistan. There's a dimension of eradication. There's public education. Very comprehensive, and I'd also say very long-term. Uh, you know, the problems that uh, we've seen in South America, the problems that we saw in Thailand, uh, those problems have taken uh, many, many years to address. I think that the government of Afghanistan remains committed. Uh, President Karzai remains very committed to the uh, battle 
against narco trafficking and to poppy production, but it's going to require a very long-term sustained effort by his government and by the international community to prevail. Barbara? I want to come back to the issue of bin Laden. Uh, many people say that the Taliban now have significantly taken some control in areas across the border in Waziristan. What does, can you give us your assessment of that? What that means in terms of a safe haven, because by all accounts, uh, bin Laden remains on that side of the border, unless you tell us he's moved back into Afghanistan. So is it your view that he is, in fact, still gettable? Can you get him because you don't cross the border into Pakistan? Uh, Barb, I wouldn't want to, uh, I, I don't want to speculate on, uh, on uh, bin Laden's uh, whereabouts, the, you know, the, the fight against the al-Qaeda network uh, continues. The, the fight against the network in a very comprehensive sense is the fight that we've got to remain focused on. Bin Laden remains one man. He does remain a man, though, in terms of the need for us to find him, to bring to closure his attacks against the United States and the international community. That's a commitment that we maintain every day, and we will not rest until we find or, and uh, capture or kill bin Laden. Now, about the network that you're talking about, though, and the piece that uh, you, your, uh, your question is addressed to about uh, that broader area of Afghanistan and Pakistan, Barbara, what I'd say there is that, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, we, uh, we work well with the uh, Pakistan military and the Afghan military. I think the operational coordination that we've got in place along the border in terms of communications, sharing of information uh, is about as good as it's ever been. The Pakistan Army right now uh, in Waziristan is conducting very intense combat operations. They've taken a good number of uh, casualties, and it's against a, a common enemy. What's your assessment, though, of Taliban control uh, along the Pakistani side of the border? The, um, I'd, I'd refer that to, uh, to Pakistan uh, government authorities to uh, give their assessment, but we've heard uh, public uh, statements that have expressed concern on their part about what they call the Talibanization of the Waziristan area. General, I'd like to go back to this question about IEDs and uh, uh, suicide bombers. Last week, General Karimi of the Afghan Security Forces said that uh, the suicide bombings and IEDs have involved Arabs, uh, presumably connected to Al Qaeda. Do you have a better understanding about who exactly is conducting these attacks, uh, where the technology has come from? Ha has it, in fact, migrated uh, from? Iraq, and, and are these weapons becoming uh, uh, as sophisticated uh, and the techniques and tactics as sophisticated as those that have been employed in Iraq? The, uh, the influence of uh, foreign fighters and uh, those foreign fighters affiliated with uh, al-Qaeda, uh, yes, that has a uh, uh, connection to what uh, we are seeing in Afghanistan. I'd highlight again it has a connection to what uh, is uh, being used to attack the Pakistan army in, uh, within Pakistan. Uh, the, the foreign fighters that uh, we see in their presence there, primarily in the area of training, uh, facilitation, providing of uh, technical expertise. Uh, we have not seen a, uh, uh, any kind of significant foreign fighter presence within uh, Afghanistan. With regard to the, uh, uh, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, we have not seen conclusive evidence that there has been any migration from Iraq to Afghanistan of foreign fighters that are bringing with them skills or capabilities. On the other hand, we have seen a steady increase in the sophistication of IEDs, a increase in the sophistication of tactics. But these are the uh, kind of uh, techniques, these are the kind of uh, skills that very frankly in today's information age can be gleaned from the uh, internet and be gleaned from uh, web pages and can be improved by a force that's operating against you over time as they continue to adapt their own tactics. But we do watch this very carefully for uh, linkages between the two theaters. And, and since the IEDs have proven to be the number one killer of American forces in Iraq, how, how big of concern are these developments, this increased sophistication in those tactics and techniques? Well, I'll tell you that uh, as uh, 
throughout the uh, United States Central uh, Command area, there is a huge devotion of uh, resources to uh, countering this threat, a very comprehensive, very sophisticated program that not only gets at the equipment, but very importantly gets at the training of our soldiers and very importantly uh, gets at improving our intelligence. For instance, in areas of Afghanistan where the government of Afghanistan continues to advance and the people uh, now start to gain more security, they develop that middle ground, it's in those areas that our IED attacks drop off because the, the people of Afghanistan then are very comfortable in reporting elements that are moving into their area that are trying to attack us. Another point I'd make on IEDs, though, again, this is in truly a combined effort. It's not just the United States and our coalition, increasingly NATO ISAF, very much the Afghan National Army, very much the Pakistan military. And we do have forums that exist and organizations that exist in which we're able to share our own tactics, techniques, and procedures, and able to uh, compare our own experiences in order to get a firmer understanding of that same enemy that's in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. General, Please. I have to ask you about the uh, thefts of flash drives at Bagram Air Force Base. Uh, it did seem, at least from uh, one of the LA Times reports, that there was some evidence that the initial security reforms may not have stopped the flow of those drives. I wonder if you could talk about that and also talk about uh, any, in general, any steps you might have done to protect informants whose identities might be have been compromised by the thefts. The, um, the uh, incident that you're uh, talking about, the um, disappearance of the uh, thin thumb drives uh, with information uh, on them and then their reappearance in uh, bazaars outside of our military base at Bagram Air Force Base, let me emphasize that we treat that uh, very seriously for a variety of reasons. One of the questions that uh, you've asked here is in terms of uh, protection of uh, people. Uh, for that and many other reasons, we take that extremely seriously. Things that we've done since then, first of all, I can't comment on the details of the investigation itself because there is an ongoing criminal investigation about uh, the disappearance of, of that uh, particular thumb drive. We have reviewed very carefully our procedures uh, throughout Afghanistan, and uh, we've taken uh, very firm steps to ensure that the policies that we had in effect are being fully enforced and we've put new policies in effect as well. Thirdly, of course, we did a very careful review of all the information that we gleaned then from the uh, information that was recovered to do an assessment of any kind of vulnerability that that uh, created. And I'm very comfortable at this point in time that we've taken the necessary steps to uh, provide safeguards to any individual and to our own operational security. But what you're left with here is that uh, with this kind of problem, uh, in this kind of challenge, I think all of us that uh, continue to uh, move through the 21st uh, century in the information age, it's a reminder to, uh, it was a reminder to my command, I think probably a reminder to all, that as this technology of information continues to advance, continuing to need in a very disciplined manner to go back and ensure that procedures that are in place are adequate to safeguard your information security. You know, something as a, a thumb drive, for instance, um, as a, a young lieutenant a few years ago, uh, as I looked at, uh, was given a, a weapon with a serial number on it, uh, I knew exactly how to safeguard that. Now we're in the 21st century where a small thumb drive uh, has probably more potency and more needs for protection than that first case I gave. So this is something that all of us uh, within our command are looking at very hard, and it's going to pose a, a challenge for us as we uh, move forward and technologies continue to uh, to evolve. Do your soldiers treat the thumb drive as carefully as they treat their, their weapon? Do they remain, uh, have control over that thumb drive in the same way as they do a weapon? Absolutely. You said that Taliban influence, um, Taliban influence has increased in certain areas. I'm just wondering what evidence you have of this and what's causing it, maybe the change in tactics. Um, what, what evidence you have of the Taliban uh, resurgence? Our, our intelligence and uh, just our presence with the Afghan National Police, the Afghan National Army, our coalition forces, uh, the governance of uh, Afghanistan out in the uh, districts uh, gives us a, um, a sense that uh, the number of uh, Taliban fighters in certain districts in the northern Kandahar, Helmand, and Orizgan area may have increased 
over the uh, past uh, several months. Reasons for that. Um, the reasons for it are uh, very uh, broad. If you get back to the starting point that what our collective challenge is is building the middle ground of Afghan civil society so the people have something firm to stand with on and then have a security perimeter around that uh, over the period of the last several years, then the need for in southern Afghanistan better governance to emerge. President Karzai has addressed that. Uh, a police program that is starting to deliver results now in southern Afghanistan but was not uh, delivering the same kind of results, say, last year that the Afghan National Army program was able to deliver. Uh, so it's a question in, in southern Afghanistan in certain of these districts. Once again, it's not necessarily the strong enemy. It's the very weak institutions of the state that in that vacuum, in that weakness, then you have Taliban influence able to move in there and through coercion of the people then to assert that influence. Once again, I'd emphasize, though, that as we look at our plan over the next several months and we look at the NATO ISAF transition, we look at the government of Afghanistan's plans, uh, I'm very confident that we will see improvements in those particular districts of southern Afghanistan. General, are you confident or do you have any concerns about the capabilities of the NATO forces that are coming in, not only their capabilities but their rules of engagement, when they may be faced with a situation where one day or one minute they're involved in stability and reconstruction and the next day they're confronting insurgents? Well, as this uh, NATO ISAF uh, transition gets ready to take place in southern Afghanistan, what's interesting is that uh, the forces, as they're coming in, getting ready for NATO ISAF transition, those forces are currently under coalition command. So the Canadians have been on the ground in, uh, in Kandahar province now for several months and operating outside of Kandahar. In fact, the brigade command in Kandahar, the command of the entire regional command south, is Brigadier General David Fraser, Canadian Army. The British now are coming into Helmand province. On the 1st of May, they just took over the provincial reconstruction team in Helmand. They've got a very robust battalion battle group that's coming into uh, Helmand. The Australians will be part of the combined force. They're already operating in Orisgan province. Uh, the Romanians will be coming into Azabal and initially operating under us. Why I go through that is, first of all, uh, they are already on the ground and they are proving themselves. The Canadians and the British, and I have absolute confidence of all the NATO forces that are coming in, they will be very capable forces. They have the correct rules of engagement, the second point, to execute the mission. And I'm quite uh, confident that NATO ISAF, under the uh, very able leadership of Lieutenant General Richards, a British Army, a very close colleague of mine, I have absolute confidence that they will prevail in the South and do well. And they're getting set and well postured to take over the mission for all of Afghanistan when we go to stage four. I need to make Pam the last question. Um, <clears throat> on the <clears throat> subject of economic reconstruction, why does Afghanistan get so much less? I don't mean to compare it to Iraq, but obviously Iraq gets a ton of it. How much more money could you use in getting the resources, all the resources that you could operationalize to really build up the economy? Well, reconstruction is not uh, my uh, is not my uh, particular uh, lead. I've got the uh, responsibility on the military and the security side. But having said that, having said that, uh, I would say that the international uh, community uh, needs to uh, continue to be more generous. The pressing needs of Afghanistan right now are roads, its power systems, its water for irrigation, its schools, and its clinics. Those are the pressing needs. And for those kind of investments that are being made, We've reached a point in the campaign where we will get more security dividends by helping the Afghan people to build that middle ground of civil society. And you targeted numbers of what would really do the job for you? I wouldn't want to uh, speculate on that, and I'd highlight also that this is an uh, international commitment. Now, in January of uh, this year at London, there was the London Compact that was signed between the international community and the Afghan government. It was a pledge for the next five years for a further over $10 billion of pledges given, given to the reconstruction. Having said that, uh, over the next several years, I believe that more must be done in terms of economic infrastructure development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.